Hey guys, it's Cam from Craft and Tailored. In this episode of The Details, we are hanging out with David Carroll and Theo Carroll, friends and dudes that I've referenced in my passion of photography. So we're gonna talk watches, we're gonna talk cameras, of course, we're gonna probably talk a little bit about Leica, we're gonna talk about your awesome body of work, and then we're gonna talk about Theo, who is the son of David, to talk about his passion of photography and kind of talk about the, the lineage of this, this family here of photographers, art, culture, all that fun stuff, so. By the way, that Coke sucked. It, yes. But uh, <laughs> again, we kid. Google that. <laughs> Let me start over. So I know about your body of work, but let's kind of give the viewer, I guess, an intro into who you are, uh, how you got started in photography. Let's talk maybe a little bit about New York City, shooting New York City in the 70s and the 80s, kind of being part of the rock and roll arts culture scene down here. So you want me to lie? Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, I got a camera when I was 18. Okay. So I started late. My friend got a camera for his 21st birthday. I thought it was cool, so I bought one. Um, I started taking pictures. What kind of camera was it? A Minolta XG7. Okay. Like around 1976. Okay. Which makes me over 40. We won't tell anybody. You look I don't care. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I earned every crack and wrinkle. And I basically, my life was revolved around riding motorcycles, meeting girls, and doing drugs. And then the camera was just a nice feature for that. So then I progressed into trying to go to art school, and I lasted about a year and a half. I dropped out because of poor funding. I didn't have any money. And uh, I got a one-way ticket to Paris. 300 bucks on People's Express. People Express Airlines never gives you double talk. People Express simply offers frequent flights at low prices, every seat, every flight. And the short story is I met a girl. She was in the industry. She was a model. I spent about a year and a half there. She got me gigs. And then I came back to New York in the early 80s. I got hooked up with the biggest photo agency in the world called the Image Bank and I became their first assignment photographer. And basically on their dime and their fancy hotels and their business class rides, I was flying around the world taking pictures. It was, it, was, it went from zero to 60 on what it is to be a photographer. If I was going up to the North Pole, yes, I did that. Um, eight times, seven times. You would ship 500 rolls of film to Toronto because they didn't want Americans doing jobs up there. Ship all the film up to Toronto, land in Toronto, get your film after customs and then take multiple planes till you got up north, and you spent two weeks up there shooting, not knowing if you had one fucking picture. And then you had to fly back going, I wonder if I got anything. So I did that, I traveled a lot. For the first time in my life, I made money, I moved to the city, got a loft, did all the bullshit that everybody would do. So when did this young gentleman come this along? Guy, and what's, the, what's the story So he has an that? older brother. Okay. And his older brother was born when we still lived in the loft in the city. And we stayed here for a few more years, then we moved to the suburbs for okay. the good schools, classic story, right? Yep. I was uh, at CBS. You know, it was a good job at CBS. I was a director, I had good income, insurance, all that shit. But you want to make more money. Right. So I always worked freelance on the side, and then he was there on the island. My job at that point was children, pay the bills, they're gonna go to college. And that was the story, I took care of all that. So yeah. the older one went to college, and this one's now in college. And he got into college because he's such a fucking good photographer. At 16, he was shooting. Brand name writers were writing about him. And every time he would send his picture into something, I had no <laughs> idea it was your son. I can't tell you how many times I got that email. I picked him, but I didn't know it was your son. Fucking A. Theo, you're kind of the next in line. What got you into photography? And, and when did you pick up a camera? And why did you want to do that? So I started shooting um, with one of your DSLRs from work, I think. They like used, an old Canon? Yeah, an old Canon. I went film to a, or digital? Digital. Digital? Yeah. I started with digital. I only started shooting film a couple of years ago. Okay. Yeah, so I started shooting, obviously because of you, but I went to a, like an art summer camp and I shot a little bit there and then it, you know, I stopped for a couple of years actually. And then in, uh, in uh, high school, I, I took a photo class and I started shooting again. I joined the photo club. I started getting really into it. Started shooting street. I, I just wanted to shoot everything. Lance. Well, how'd you get interiors. your first digital camera? So I started shooting with the Fuji. That was my first like rangefinder camera. Yeah. And you know, it was just so much easier to, to shoot like that compared to like the big bulky DSLR. Which right, was... I remember when I first started shooting rangefinder, it's like a 
it's kind of like a different language. And I know that you shoot a Q. I've been shooting a Q2 a lot. It's a really awesome camera. I kind of use that same focusing method on the Q, although it's not the same as a rangefinder. But tell me about Leica giving you a camera and all that kind of stuff. What's the story there? What happened was, were we at my show? We were somewhere where you met Tom. You've met Tom a few times. And Tom said, why don't you try the Q? Because he saw you had that Fuji thing. And he started using it and the difference was... Especially at night, the Leica is just so much better. Like, because I used to shoot a lot in diners at night. Yep. So they gave me like the um, the model that they'd lend out to everyone. Yeah. And when the Q2 came out, we bought like the old beat up one. Yeah. That's been, you know, passed around a lot, but... Well, you had it for a good two years. Yeah, yeah. I obviously became aware of your work through your dad. I guess met through watches. You had a watch question or whatever. And I'll make believe that's what happened. I can't remember. I can't remember really, yeah. but I think it was something along those lines. And then you said, hey, you got to check out my, my son's work. There's one photo that you have when I think of Theo Carroll's work. It's the dude on the street. It's a very New York photo and he's like flipping you off. I really relate to that photo because I was in Paris and there was like this gypsy kid sitting like on the street and he's like feeding this bunny rabbit you know lettuce or whatever and this is right after I started shooting 35 millimeter film so I ended up taking this photo and I didn't really know what I was doing but it's one of the, my favorite photos and it's, it's this kid who's like flipping me off because they didn't want his picture taken and so that's one of my favorite photos that you've taken because you know it's, you were there yeah it captures that moment but also can, I mean a fuck you and a bunny there's a you know a contrast <laughs> there's like wait bunny is cute fuck you is a little aggressive, yeah. right? They think, you know, they're like flipping off. They're saying, fuck you. They're trying to ruin your photo, but then it they just, make it. Yeah, they make yeah, it better. Yeah. We were going through his pictures last night and he has a picture of these two Orthodox Jews, I guess in the forties, right? Like yeah. jewelry kind of guys. Okay. And they're walking towards him and the guy goes like this to Theo. And then there's an Orthodox guy with the shit on his face. I'm Jewish, I can say this, with all the shit. And he's behind him. The whole photo was the guy going, stop. And meanwhile, the guy's trying to stop the photo. He made Theo's photo. Yeah. Right. You know, two dudes walking into his face. Let me say something about film versus analog. I look at it like this. It's gasoline in a car. For sure. If you're going to start talking about $3 versus $5 a gallon, I know in LA you're paying five. <laughs> you're never going to drive your car. I buy a lot of film. You know, I might buy a couple hundred rolls at a time. And it's not relevant. Now, for him as a kid, it is. And that's why he was processing his own film. And I mean, let's be honest, I'm giving him film. And I even say I'll process some of your film. But that's not a factor for me. A good friend of mine, Joni Sternbach, great photographer, we were discussing getting digital Leicas. And I said, I don't know, I don't want to learn, I don't want to fucking play with a computer if I don't have to. And she said, well, all you're going to do is try to make the digital look like film anyway, so why bother? Right. And that's the bottom line for me. Film has a look and a feel. Right. We, we talked about this the other day. You primarily shoot on M6. You're using, what, 21 to 24? I use a 21 or a 24. They're okay. almost interchangeable with me. The way I say it, it's like a three-step difference. Right. You know, there's a distortion in 24 and 21 that if the person can see that, to me it ruins the picture. I don't want to see technique before the photo. So I have bodies with 24s and bodies with 21s. I never change lenses. They're locked on forever. These viewfinders are here because 99% of the time when I'm shooting, I focus with zone. Meaning if I'm stopped down eight and a half or 11, I know exactly where I'm most of the time I'm setting this. So if I'm on anywhere outside where it's far away, I do this, that's affinity. Right. Otherwise it's here, I don't even look and boom, it goes at like nine. Right. You know, and I know it. So there's this and there's this. Essentially what we're talking about is feel, right? Like we're talking about, you know, with, with shooting an analog camera or even like shooting a cue in full manual, there's a, an element of feel that's going to allow you to capture that photo. But I think like with watches, right, I'll put on a Daytona or a Speedmaster before I do anything, I'm winding that watch. And that kind of brings me to that element of an experience versus just putting this thing on to tell the time. Yeah, I mean, but you see, I don't even look at it that deep. I'm kind of pedestrian. Yeah. Watches are cool. They're mechanical. I like design. Yeah. I like things that are made smart, and things made smart in the 60s are probably going to be made, they're still good. Yeah. For example, two of these M6s I bought new in 84, maybe 85, and I'm still using them. Right. They've traveled the world, they've been dropped on the ground, they've been from Russia to, they've been everywhere. Right. I don't want to learn another camera. So, I mean, it was that simple. And as far as watches go, I just think watches are cool. Yeah. 
You know, Theo said a great thing. Somebody who we're not gonna mention that we're all friends with was asked about why he wears a certain watch, a 1016. And he starts telling this whole story and Theo writes to me, he goes, why doesn't he just say, cause he thinks it makes him look cool. And at the end of the day, that was it. It's a cool fucking watch from 1960, whatever. Yeah. So it was funny and it's true. I got no problem with saying, I think this looks cool. You know, there's like this time and place that happened, I think in, you know, let's say post-war, like late 40s, early 50s into the 60s. And it kind of stopped like, I would say maybe like in the 90s, something like that, where there's these things that kind of come out of this time and place that are kind of the icons. And there's like this golden era in time where that stuff was kind of coming together. You look at like an M240 and it's like a wider, but there's like a step. You know, this is of... all basically the same design as 1954 M3. Exactly. They didn't change much. So what they did was they got smart. They go, oh, maybe wider. And then they made the crank better. Yeah. Then Leica came out with a camera that went to the old shitty crank from the M3. Well, I don't get that one. Like, <laughs> My point is they took one camera in 54 and they just sort of... But look it. at like the Sub or a C-Master 300 thing. or like same a thing. Daytona, right? It's like, how do you reinvent an icon? It, it would almost suck to be a, a, an iconic watch Well, that's why designer. people say Rolex is boring, right? Meanwhile, they're smart. Right. They use Tudor to fuck around. But um, totally. yeah, so I mean, things that make sense is design and function really matter to me. It's a weird obsessiveness. Yeah. And then there's the rest of the shit I don't care about. Make life easy, you know. Totally. Yeah. And he's screwed because he grew up in that. He grew up looking at photographs and he meets every photographer. He's like, he has something to prove. He has to fucking succeed now. <laughs> His teachers will say he's better than me. And you know what? They're right. He is better than me. Just one said that. She's right. <laughs> I think the, one of the best thing about Theo's photography is he takes pictures for himself, doesn't really share them because who cares? You know, when all us old guys were shooting, we had like three friends we showed pictures to. There was no social media. It's bad. You're getting critiqued and analyzed and judged by people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Also, you <laughs> take like pictures, it. I don't see my film for weeks. Because right. I don't have to, it's not work anymore. Work, you have to see it the next day. For work, it's the greatest thing ever, digital. Because then you know if you get the picture, you can go right. on. But for your own personal expression, get the fuck away from the moment when you took the picture. And then in a month, look at it, you won't really remember the moment. And then you can really look at the picture and see for the first time, is this any good? Yeah. And that's a, a way to evolve, certainly. I love getting film back. I just kind of collect all my rolls of film, then I send it in and it gets processed. I have a bag sitting over there, yeah. And then you're like, oh my God, I remember that moment. And that's like But the sometimes thing. the picture is better because if you were trying to get somebody doing something and you looked and it wasn't that exact thing, you go, oh fuck, I blew it. But a month later you might go, oh, that's great. I didn't know I was trying to get them to do this and they still, they did this. Yeah. You know, whatever it is. So that has more value getting space between you. I mean, not everybody believes this, but I'm right. <laughs> Whether they believe me or not, I'm right. <laughs> And all the good photographers I know say the same thing. And if they don't, I, I make believe they do. The quick story on this thing is, I traded this watch for something maybe 10 years ago, eight years ago. Okay. And I've always looked on eBay to see if I could ever find another one. I've never seen another one that says Tourneau on it. Um, it's a Hoyer with a La Magna, is that what you yeah. said? Probably a 5100? So I was looking at eBay less than a year ago, and I saw this, and it was broken. The hands had fallen off and something. They were selling it for as is, one of those deals. Yeah. And on the picture, it looked like it had this scrape and chip in it. And I thought, that's my old watch. Because I remember hitting this on a rock in Mexico. And I actually gave it to you. You guys fixed it. Yeah. You put the hand back. I don't know if it was working. And I have it back. Theo insists it's not really the one. But there's I no... I think you just want it to be. Well, I do want it to be. <laughs> you know, uh, we did a video with Magnus Walker. And he has an early Porsche Design 1. This is actually early PVD. And what's weird is it's like a little bit softer and it kind of like wears off and leaves kind of well, like feel this this. gray. You can feel that this is yeah, not yeah. a hardened. It's like a soft. Yeah. Like... Is this the same time as his? Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. That's anyway, cool. so that's like my first good watch. It's interesting with some of this stuff. How do you know what it is that you're into? You know what I've noticed over the years? I only want tool watches. Yeah. And I pretty much buy chronographs and deep sea divers and I have a couple of pilot watches, but I don't even really wear those. But Theo's right. The other one, that Breitling. Should I hold the Breitling? Breitling? Yeah that I got in, I think, 1990. By the way, the salesman told me, Bruce Willis wore this in Die Hard. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, even at the time, I was young, I said, is that good? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but he convinced me by a quartz watch because he goes, you don't have to deal with it. It seemed to me, I don't think I ever had a quartz watch. Yeah. Oh, I had a bull of a Accutron? Okay. When I was in high school, that's what the I The Accutron had. is interesting and they're kind of Well, you could see back. it through the thing. It was like green. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I had that watch. I forgot about that. So you guys were kind of talking about maybe what watches you wanted to talk about, and you were saying that this watch is in a lot of your family photos, and that's why you guys kind of wanted to talk about this piece. Well, he hates this watch, actually. <laughs> because it's quartz. He, yeah, because yeah. it's quartz, but I think it looks cool. I think it's really cool. I love the bracelet on these. Yeah, it's not for sale. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> I'll trade you straight up for the Daytona right now. Mm, I'll think about it. You will, huh? <laughs> I could see this ultimately coming back. It's not, you know, it's not oversized. It's 40 millimeter. The bracelet's cool. And then I'll show you one more watch that I wear like most of the time. Cause I feel like this is like a Leica. You can't break it. Yeah. So this, this is my last watch story. So Theo comes into my bedroom on your computer and says, look at this thing. You have to buy it. And I said, what is it? I never even heard of Doxa. Although the orange looked familiar. Yeah. And he goes, buy it. And I said, why? He goes, cause it's a really good price and then never for sale. So I bought it. And he was right. And I wear this when I travel because nobody notices it. Doxa was really an interesting company because they had a really early involvement with Jacques Cousteau and like- That's what's cool. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Theo's watch, which I think is a really, really cool watch. It was a sleeper for a while, the Explorer 2. Uh, modern, I think this is a reference, what is this, 16570? Yeah. Yeah. This was his high school graduation present. I told him, go pick out a watch. Okay. And he looked at a lot of watches. Do you start with Speedmasters and shit? So it was like before I even knew like anything about watches at all. So we were in like London Jewelers, I think, in the mall. And I was looking at Speedmasters, but it was just a little bit too big for my wrist, I think, yeah. the 42. And this thing kind of just stood out to you as you were looking through, you know, the watch cases, right? Yeah, I, I don't know why. I think it's the arrow, maybe, like GMT the GMT hand. hand. Yeah. I like triangles, just all the shapes. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, just really it's interesting. Pretty. And you wear it on a strap primarily? Yeah. He has a bracelet. Wrist. I do have the bracelet, but I think it helps with my smaller wrist. So you have an Explorer 1 and an Explorer 2. That's what he wanted. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, kind of the thing that's funny is they're both Explorers, but they're really they're not different the same watch. watches. Yeah. yeah, which is cool. Now that you're semi-retired shooting. No, I retired, fun. I left okay. CBS and I retired, <laughs> but I retired knowing that I was starting a book publishing company with Ashley Stoll. Okay. We made the book, it went viral and sold out in weeks. She was on TV in LA, she did, it was called Charth Vader. And once we made that book, we're, she said, this is a lot of fun, why don't we keep making books? So this is Ashley's latest book and it's called The Days Are Long and The Years Are Short. So you know the metaphor for like, yeah. the days are long with the kids and then suddenly it's over. Leica came to me a few years back and asked, I love me, this. asked me to do a retrospective. And they normally make a catalog and I said, hey, I happen to own a publishing company, why don't we make a fucking book? So we did and it's pretty much sold out now. I think there's 30 or 40 left. And so we published this. Then we did a book called Born Back. And a lot of you probably know her photograph of Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's right before he passed away. Yep. And it was on the cover of Vanity Fair. And this book did great, it won awards and some stuff. So and cool. now Peanut Press, if you go to the website, has a new series called Peanut Press Portfolios. God, this sounds like an ad. But we do this. I think it's so cool. Let's but keep talking about it. By the way, it. I don't have to do anything. We're doing this because we want to do it. So almost all the books we're doing in the Peanut Press Portfolios are well-known photographers, 18 images in each book, and it comes with an original signed print. And you think watches went up in price. Photography makes watches, other than Daytonas and a couple, <laughs> photography blew up. So we're making these books, like our last series of nine. Uh, this is Lori Nix and Kathleen Gerber's book. And take a look at this, Ken. They build fake worlds. Wow. That's not a real place. And that's the winter version. Wow, so they build these sets and they take photos of them. Yes. And she won a Guggenheim for this. Wow. It sold out, but you would get one of her prints, which costs thousands for $125 and a book. $125 and a book. So That's cool. Hudson, Hudson. And so everybody can find this at peanutpress.com. Peanutpressbooks.com. We'll I provide hope, a link you know in the description what? below. Yeah. You know, I can get all corny about little treasures of fabric, but I've had books come out and it's landmark shit. To me, when I was growing up, books mattered. Books were on shelves everywhere. Books mattered. And to me, this is the best way to see photographs. Yeah. Anyway, so that was my little peanut press book. So I think we're going to go maybe grab some lunch, do some shooting. Yes. Yeah. Maybe you can teach me a thing or two. Maybe you can teach me a thing or two. So uh, let's go, let's go shoot. Bye everybody. <laughs>
So one of my favorite places to come when I land at JFK is the Leica store in Soho. Love it. One of the things that uh, I've talked to David a lot about is um, how to shoot. And so during our photo walk today, uh, I got to learn a little bit more about that. I primarily shoot on Leica M bodies and I've been using a lot of Q bodies. Theo uses primarily a Q um, and David is using pretty much M6s and you kind of have a cool, I guess, way of shooting because you shoot basically on the same stuff. You kind of have figured out what has worked for you. You're shooting what, L Ford HP5 400 ISO film. Yeah, so what I'm doing is I, I have bodies of 24s, I have bodies of 21s. I have some, I have an M, two M4s and also an M5. So I switch it up a little bit, but mostly I use M6s with 24s and 21s. But uh, yeah, that's what I do. I try to keep everything the same um, because I want everything to feel the same, you know? I want to feel like I don't have a camera. I just want to feel like we're doing it. We just walked for a little while taking pictures and Cam asked the smart questions. The question's like, so do I do this, this, and this? And I'm like, you're always looking ahead or to the sides. And if you know the thing that might be about to happen is in the shade, as you're walking there, you're changing your aperture and your shutter speed. So when you arrive, you're ready. You don't arrive and go, oh shit, uh, and then it's over. And then you miss it. Yeah. I don't know if you would call it maybe like shooting from the hip or you, you can almost kind of, you're, you're using. Well, I use zone focusing. Zone focusing, yeah. So I think that's the term, but the yeah. Zone focusing, yeah. I'm a professional. There's like basically three focus settings for me. Pull it in close, put it in the middle, and shit, stuff's far away, pull it the other way. Right. And that's what my hands are always doing. It's driving, it feels like driving. Yeah. You know, the more you do it, you realize it's really like five exposures you use and maybe three focusing points. I mean, it's it, easy. Anybody no, can but, be a famous, well, you know, amazing award-winning photographer. I like, will say this, I've never won an award. Uh, but my books have won awards. That's right, not me. Um, <laughs> but no, I'll say this. I think that that stuff, anybody can learn and it just becomes like repetition. You're not forcing a style, but you develop one if you have maybe, I mean, all my friends who are good have a style. I recognize their pictures. The thing about Theo is he's early now and he's developing a style, but he's beyond a lot of shit I've seen. So Theo has these, this ability to see things and he finds he's curious about things and knows what's off or odd or whatever it is. When he was getting notoriety at 16 or 17, the whole thing was like, how is this possible for like a kid? Now, I feel he's much older at 20 and people are like, how is this possible for a kid? And I don't know, but it's an interesting progression of life. Yeah, when is that point? Cause like, I think within the vintage watch world, you know, we're kind of the younger- Neo young. young. Neo young. Yeah, like the I don't know. elder what... millennial, so to yeah, speak, yeah. right? And uh, I'm, I've always been referred to as like the kid, which is, is it's something that doesn't bother me. But You're it, over 30. Uh, yeah, I am. Are there. you the kid anymore? I don't know. I don't know. I think so. I think there's like a lot of old, like crusty watch dealers out there. Maybe no offense, guys. I love you, but let's uh, name names. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I don't know. I mean, I, I guess for me, the the fun thing about this, and I think the correlation to Leica and you know photography and vintage watches is that there are these things that kind of stand the test of time for a reason. And I think there's also styles and things that kind of evolve with with that, the thing that I like most about shooting Leica, I have other cameras in my collection and other things that I, that I shoot with, but I think there's like this familiarity with it. And again, we were talking about like experience and feel and feel. Well, let me say this about the Leica, and this is a fact. I wanted my first Leica because Gary Winogrand had one and Joel Meyer was, and all these guys had them. So I just thought it was cool. So I wanted this German cool camera and it turned out they were right. It made more sense, it was easier to use, yeah. and it made sense for what I was doing. Theo has the luxury of he got to play with a lot of cameras, and it turns out Leica's worked for him too. Like it was you know, good. I used to carry um, a Nikon F3 and then the digital Q. Right. And I mean, everything on the Leica and the Nikon are backwards. Yeah, when we were talking about like that feel, right? You move, I think, you know, again, when I'm wearing certain watches, for me, I feel differently about myself. From an artistic perspective, it might change the, the output of what it is that you're trying to capture. I think it's a chicken and an egg. If I know I'm going for a road trip, I'm gonna bring at least two cameras. Right. Like if I'm in the car, if I'm walking around the city, it's one camera. But I think one of the problems I have is, I'm done, it's Leica's, you know what I mean? So it's yeah. not like I have to have a Nikon or I have to have a, it doesn't make a difference. 
that's kind of interesting too because I think you know when you look at like Rolex or other watch manufacturers throughout history there is like this uh separation between the camera manufacturers and watch manufacturers it's like, it's like oh we're doing this and this is a proprietary in-house blah 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 but back in the day it's like look at like the Leica CL right like that camera was it's a Minolta right um and you had these these companies kind of like almost like working together to kind of like by the way that's a great camera that Minolta yeah I mean there was nothing wrong with it a lot of companies, and I'm not going to name Canon or Nikon, but a lot of companies <laughs> change their mounts, so you can't even use your fucking lenses from like the good Canon lenses from the 80s. It's a right. fact. Like it doesn't do that shit because probably because they're smart enough not to do it. Yeah. I think the cool thing about this place, and one of the reasons why I wanted to kind of you know, do this here is because I, I come here and I know that you do too. And sometimes like I'll just come like pop in for like 10 or 15 minutes, flip through a couple of the books, grab some inspiration. Maybe I'll forget something. Like, I don't know how many thumbs up grips I've bought from, from here, but like- Let me tell you what's great about this store. You can walk in here, you can buy an M, you can buy any camera and you can walk about 10 minutes and be in Washington Square Park going nuts, taking pictures. So if you come to New York and you forgot your camera and don't want to just use your phone, Come here, buy a camera, and then walk up to Washington Square and take pictures. And if you bump into me, like this face here, if you see me there taking pictures, you won't. But if you see me there taking pictures, come and say, hey, I just bought a Leica from uh, the Leica store. And I'll say, what do you want from me? <laughs> no, but you can do that. You can come here and just walk up to the park. Yeah. It's a great neighborhood. For sure. Yeah. But you know, kind of like bringing this back into watches, like we've got some like really awesome Daytonos here, uh, both white gold. This one is pretty hot right, blue dial, white gold, uh, modern Daytona. But you know, we're talking about like the history of some of these things. And if you look at them, there's that kind of consistent lineage, even though they're so different. Well, it's like the Leica thing, a 54 M3 doesn't look very different than an M10. Right, I mean, we've got like this guy, which is like the exotic Kevlar Safari version with all kinds of crazy paint and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's all cool. Listen, you know, they're a tool, they do a good job. But at the same time, it's cool to have something fun yeah. that makes sense. You know, watches tell time. I could do that with my phone, but I think it's fun to have cool watches that a, a person designed to serve a purpose. And the Leicas were designed to serve a purpose. They do their job. And I think watches, certainly Rolexes, are all designed as a tool. Yeah. What's the one for spelunking? Oh, uh, the Explorer, right? The 1655. Right, it's for spelunking. Right, like this one's made out of like Kevlar. It's like bulletproof. Well, this is like, when it's the reporter, right? So yeah, so you're like this, like yeah, like dodging yourself. bullets. Like it probably could, right? But oh, I'll make a point about that. So the first time I went to the Arctic was 1987, and a camera manufacturer, I'm not going to say who it was, gave me equipment that was winterized, okay. but I brought two of my M6s with me. It was about 40, 50 below most of the time, and you live in it. You stay in the back of a Kamataki. You don't go into buildings. You're on the ocean. It's frozen. You're on the ice, and you're photographing. And I had, you know, my list of things. It was assignment, and the two cameras or three cameras they gave me that were winterized stopped working. Interesting. And both M6s worked fine. And I shot 80% of the pictures more, maybe, other than needing a 300 lens that I did with those very slowly. The Leicas did everything, and they were not winterized. And at that point, they were probably four years old, and they were fine. I guess I'm not really like a full-blown camera nerd, but I guess there is that technical side of, you know, uh, analog photography. And also, especially with Leica, there's this, you know, kind of artful design and kind of commonality that I wanted to talk about. Um, Listen, you may not be at 50 below every day, but when you are and it works, you go, wow. Right. You say, wow, because it's still working. It's amazing. Nothing else is working. We'll put up a picture taken at 50 below zero where one of these cameras actually worked. This is the part where you throw up Joe with the fish. I mean, you wind it slowly. You don't want to break the film, but yeah. What's the, what was the story about that? Because the fish was frozen. Okay, so the story was we were up there for a couple of weeks. Twice we had seen Inuit families. So this is north of Baffin Island fishing. And they have a Kumatuck, which is like a sled. They're pulling, and it had a whole pile of fish, like logs set up, but they were fish. Arctic char is this big. So we we're staying with this guy, Elijah, who used to take me out there every time. And Joe, who was with me, said to Elijah, can we go find fish? And he goes, sure, I'll bring you out. So I stayed, it's like a hunter's shack. And I stayed there and he came back and he comes walking off all proud, holding this fish up. And I said, stop. And I took some pictures. I said, where did you get that? And he goes, oh, we met a family and they gave us one. 
he said it was kind of amazing. They just put hooks in the water. There's not even bait on it because the fish will bite anything because it's wind. I don't yeah. know. And they said they were pulling them out and they handed him one and it kind of went. Wow. And that was it. And they saw them into steaks. But I wanted to eat it as sushi, so we let it defrost uh, in the like um, tent. Uh, with, like, yeah. yeah, we had like a Coleman stove and that kind of thing. Yeah. And then we ate it like sushi. It was killer. Wow. Well, thanks guys for, for tuning in. Of course, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm gonna provide some links in the description below to both David and Theo's Instagrams, to Peanut Press, so that you guys can check out the books from uh, Peanut Press, which are incredible. And then also I want to thank uh, Like a Store of Soho for allowing us to talk about some gear, host us here. I'll provide a link in the description below so you can check out their Instagram and also uh, check out equipment. I think that they have a lot of really great pre-owned stuff as well. So if you're wanting to get into some Leica stuff, um, I would suggest maybe looking at the pre-owned stuff. They always have a, a great selection of pre-owned stuff. So I'll provide a link in the description below as well. So thanks for tuning in guys. We'll see you in the next one. Goodbye again. <laughs>